All right, good morning, everybody. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first, a few course announcements, and those of you who are on the mailing list already know all of this. Since we had to cancel last week's uh, lecture, we've made a couple of adjustments to the course schedule. So um, at the end of the course, now we're going to be tacking lectures on. We're going to skip the week of March 30th because that's both uh, spring break and the first day of Passover, so we're going to skip that week. And the lecture by Paul Meltzer on large-scale expression analysis, which was originally scheduled for today, will take place instead on April 6th. And you can get the updated copy of the syllabus on the course's website. So even though we've got mountains of snow outside, we need to talk about mountains of sequence data today. And so with that, uh, I, it's my pleasure to introduce to you to today's lecturer, Dr. Elliot Margulies. Elliot is an investigator in the genome technology branch at NHGRI. His research program is focused on developing bioinformatic approaches for identifying and characterizing regions of the human genome that are evolutionarily conserved across multiple species. Uh, and you've hopefully started to develop uh, an appreciation for why this is important over the past several lectures, particularly from Dr. Green's introductory lecture in the first week. Since these kinds of approaches allow us to identify important parts of the <coughs> genome, that are uh, code for genes or function as regulatory elements. Um, his uh, research program, like many of the lecturers in this course, employ both laboratory-based and computationally-based uh, approaches in uh, accomplishing his research with the goal of finding evolutionarily conserved sequences and determining their functional significance. Uh, Dr. Margulies has played a key role in uh, the ENCODE consortium, the effort that was uh, aimed at compiling a nice comprehensive encyclopedia of all of the functional elements in the human genome, the effort that Dr. Green described to you in week one. Uh, Elliot is also at the forefront of developing new methodologies that are intended to capitalize on next generation sequencing technologies, positioning us to be better able to address key questions both in genomic biology and in clinical medicine. Uh, his lecture today will be devoted to next generation sequencing technologies, during which he'll be providing you a nice survey of the various platforms that are currently available and giving you some examples of how these technologies can be used in practice. So please uh, join me in welcoming today's lecturer, Dr. Elliot Margulies. Thank you, Andy, for that uh, kind introduction. Also, thank you, uh, Paul Meltzer, for being so kind to uh, shift your schedule so that I could be uh, fit in uh, one week later. And uh, thank you to the crowd who uh, is probably itching to get out of your house and into a nice, fun lecture all about new sequencing technologies. So I should uh, start by saying this is actually a, an incredibly difficult lecture to put together because uh, normally when you give lectures year after year, you kind of look at your slides, you adjust a couple here and there, and then you can kind of move on. And a year or so ago, I had uh, devoted half of, of my current topics lecture to new sequencing technologies. Virtually all of those slides are obsolete. This is such, I, the one thing that I would like to, well, there are many things, but one of the many things I would like to emphasize today is how rapidly moving this technology is, and, and how, or this field is. And what I would like to um, get across to you is not so much uh, data points. Sometimes people can be focused on, you know, how many bases do you get out of this particular technology, you know, and how, what's, what's the most cost-effective way of doing something. What I'd rather get across to you are the concepts, the way these methods are working, and what are the benefits uh, to using one method over another, and, and what's the rationale behind these methods, and then how can they be employed, and hopefully give you an idea of the trajectory of where these methods are going. And just to give you an idea of, of how rapidly moving this field is, from uh, last week when I submitted my slides to this week, I actually had to update some things uh, for some, some late-breaking information that I was able to find out over the last few days. So, uh, and I think part of this uh, rapid moving right now is, is because there's a, a meeting happening next week um, uh, related to new sequencing technology. So all of these companies are rapidly trying to get their latest, greatest technology out the door uh, just in time for uh, this, this meeting to take place. Okay, so just a very brief overview of, of what we're going to talk about over the next hour plus time for together is I'll give you some background on uh, why we actually want to sequence DNA, and then we'll go over the, the technologies and then uh, get across some of the applications. So it's pretty much split into these kind of three high-level high areas. Um, and we're working. Okay, so this is a, we're starting a little philosophical here. Uh, why sequence DNA? It's, it's uh, an important question to answer because 
we're talking about sequencing gigabases of DNA very cheaply and very fast. And why, why are we trying to do this? Well, the, the first, as was mentioned before, is, is for comparative genomics reasons. The, the DNA is the fundamental unit of, of heredity. Um, this is something that we've, we've learned in basic biology now. Obviously, to get the genome sequence of an organism is the first step in understanding and, and creating the foundation of, of uh, being able to put all that biology that we want to learn about a particular organism. A uh, particular interest of mine is in comparative sequence analysis by being able to compare all of these interesting organisms uh, to each other to find uh, regions of, the, of genomes that are, are, can, are candidates to be functional. So these new sequencing technologies are starting to allow us to sequence many, many more genomes to advance the fields of comparative genomics and the algorithms that we can develop there. But there are many other reasons than just to sequence um, DNA to understand a particular genome. Uh, a, a great example that I heard actually Eric Lander give is uh, equating DNA sequencing to uh, personal computing. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, when a computer was designed, it was designed for a very specific task. Um, now a personal computer is used for everything from a calculator to managing your photos. Uh, and this was never envisioned before uh, when we designed computers back, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And sequencing is becoming the same thing. It's becoming a general purpose tool to identify functional sequences uh, and characterize uh, genomes. And so one of the other ways that we're, we're now using sequencing is to look for variation among uh, different organisms uh, or, or different individuals of the same organism. Two uh, brief examples I give here that we'll actually talk about a little bit towards the end of my talk um, are, are finding out differences between uh, a tumor and uh, the, the actual uh, uh, normal genome in an individual, uh, looking for what, what are called somatic mutations. And uh, this has become very powerful, especially when you have a reference sequence uh, like the human genome, with which to align other human genomes to. Uh, these new sequencing technologies become tremendously powerful. Uh, but the other area that I will touch on a little bit as well are uh, what we call now counting experiments. Uh, and a great review of these types of methods uh, was uh, written by uh, Barbara Wald and uh, Rick Myers, uh, listed over here. Um, and these, these types of methods uh, have become very popular, the so-called chip-seek, so ways of finding uh, parts of the genome that uh, your favorite protein binds to, uh, something called RNA-seq, which is a way of, of accurately quantitating gene expression uh, by sequencing the RNA um, of, a, uh, of a particular cell or, um, or tissue, um, and also things like uh, methyl-seq, uh, which um, are looking at uh, methylation status of various parts. And I believe that uh, Laurel Nitsky in her talk will probably be touching on a lot of these areas in much more detail than, than I will here. I'll focus more on how the technology can capture this, these bits of information. Okay, so uh, that's why we would want to sequence DNA. This is just a brief uh, 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 overview, uh, going back to Eric Green's lecture on the kind of the history of, of DNA sequencing. The, the bottom line from this talk is that there were obviously over 100 years ago some fundamental things identified about DNA, the, first of all, discovering the molecule itself, understanding that it is the unit of heredity, and then kind of in the late 70s coming up with this concept of, of using dideoxy uh, 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 nucleotides um, in, a, in a very fancy way, um, Fred Sanger I, uh, developed this method to to really popularize and be able to kind of commercialize the ability to do DNA sequencing much like, um, now I, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to use uh, companies, but you know, much like Kaigen has kind of popularized the ability to do a mini prep for DNA. You know, this is now a very, you know, uh, canned thing that we can do. And many times people don't even know the chemistry behind uh, what's going on when, when they're sequencing DNA anymore. But what's really happened from the, from the late 70s to the late 90s uh, is really an improvement of the dideoxy sequencing method, automating it more, moving away from slab gels to capillaries, uh, and, and every part of the process being automated and refined uh, with the nucleotides and what fluorophores are being put on these nucleotides and the polymerases that are being used. All of this is built around the dideoxy sequencing. And in the late, mid to late 90s, the Human Genome Project uh, began um, uh, to really ramp up and become uh, create major factories for genome sequencing using this method. And it kind of plateaued in kind of the, uh, in the early 2000s with, with our ability to, to um, 
do more sequencing. We, we certainly got great at commercializing and in factorizing all of this, but um, there came a point of kind of no return where if you built more machines, you weren't actually getting more efficiency here. And this is where some of these new sequencing technologies kind of completely transform things. So we kind of coasted for a while with the, with the dideoxy sequencing and, and really the, the main uh, machine that kind of drew, uh, was kind of uh, the, the front of all of this is, is this Applied Biosystems 3730 machine. You could kind of stick a, I think they call this a hotel, uh, where you kind of stick a bunch of 96 well or 384 well plates in it, and over the course of several days you could just walk away and this machine just kind of churned away, generating the sequence. And uh, so you had factories of these machines sitting in various places around the world, just creating enormous amounts of, of uh, DNA that was then analyzed. And we, we got really good at understanding the chromatographs from these machines. Um, and the, but the way of, of really changing things happened maybe four or five years ago uh, with the advent of some of these, people call them next generation sequencing technologies. I try and stay away from that term even though the title of my talk is next generation. I like to call it new sequencing technologies because there's always gonna be something new now. And we're in, again, another kind of really rapid growth phase with the ability to sequence a lot more DNA faster and, and cheaper. And, and the rest of my talk is aimed at describing these new methods to you. So here are kind of the, what I would consider kind of the three main players today, and there, there are some more players coming on the scene that I'll introduce you to a little bit. So the, the first kind of next generation sequencing platform was this machine uh, from a company called 454, which then got bought by a company called Roche, and so now it's called the Roche 454 Pyro Sequencing Machine, and it's this little cutesy machine that's got a little monitor on top of it, and, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. The, the next uh, player to come on the field has become, uh, was originally from a company called Selexa, which was then bought by a company called Illumina. And uh, th this thing is called the Genome Analyzer. They're now up to uh, the Genome Analyzer 2X uh, for, for those who are counting over here. And the, the mainstay behind this, and I'll describe this in detail, is, is uh, the, the chemistry behind it is this reversible terminator chemistry, different, very different than the dideoxy sequencing. And then the other um, player on the field is uh, from a company called Applied Biosystems, which now got bought out by Life Technologies. So you can see everybody's buying everybody to, to try and get their share in, in this uh, new sequencing technologies field. And this is kind of an interesting way of using a ligation-based extension to, to do sequencing. And so we'll, we'll talk a lot about these three platforms, uh, but I'll also touch on some of the the new, new sequencing technologies, and one of them is from a company called Helicos. Uh, and so I should mention that these, these machines, they call them single molecule sequencing, but what they really are actually clonally amplified single molecules for sequencing because the detection of a single molecule and the fluorescence off of a single molecule is very difficult. And that's really the difference with these two new machines in that um, they, uh, they, they, they are truly sequencing single molecules. And I'll describe a little bit, actually, on the, the Pacific Biosciences uh, machine, uh, uh, kind of how that works a little bit. I, I won't touch on the, the details behind this method, but it is kind of true single molecule sequencing here. Okay, um, a review that came out last month and is already outdated um, is this, uh, it's actually a great review from Michael Metzger at the uh, Baylor uh, College of Medicine uh, on new sequencing technologies, and he outlines a lot of the different methods that I'll be talking about, and I actually uh, uh, borrow some of his uh, figures um, uh, to nicely describe some of the, the methods that are being used here. Uh, when I say this is outdated, there, there are a couple tables that I'll point to where, uh, you know, again, I say everybody wants to know what's the throughput of this machine? How many gigabases can I sequence? Well, he's got a table in there which, you know, is, is already outdated, and I'll, I'll show you some, some details of that. But it definitely gives you an idea of, of where things are going. I guess uh, this is a, a good time for me to say, you know, it's, it's very difficult to tease out objectively what each of these machines can do. You can't simply go to one of these companies' websites because they'll tell you what they think their machine can do a few months from now, you know, and, and, uh, but they don't really tell you that it's a few months from now. Or, and some, some are better than others, and, try, and, I'll, and I'll try and point out the differences when you, when it, you, 
we try and make an apples to apples comparison between one machine and another. For, for example, one machine may run one flow cell, uh, while another machine may run two flow cells at the same time. So, one, so the other machine might say it produces twice as much data, but it also produces in twice as much time at twice as much cost. So it's a little bit difficult to try and, and get down to that apples to apples comparison, and I'll try and tease that out for you uh, through the rest of this talk. Okay, so one of the ways I like to look at these, these uh, three main uh, different methods of sequencing is, is uh, highlighted in this graph. And there, there are certainly trade-offs. So uh, what I've uh, shown over here is, is a uh, kind of a hypothetical, it's not hypothetical, but it's not uh, drawn to scale, I guess, is the right, right word here, throughput, which is kind of a, either measured in kilobases, megabases, or gigabases. And you can either say, you know, uh, tens or hundreds of megabases or single tens or hundreds of gigabases. So it's, it's, we're really talking about orders of magnitude here. And then along the, the x-axis is the read length. So uh, some of these technologies, like uh, the Illumina platform, the AB or Life Technologies solid machine, and the Helicos machine, produce relatively short reads on the order of 25, 50 bases, maybe up to 100 or even 150 bases, but not much, much larger than that. But they can produce a, a massive amount of, of this, what we call short read sequence data. And then you've got this uh, pyro sequencing machine from 454 Roche, uh, that produces reads in the order of, of three to 400 bases. And, and they'll tell you they're coming out with something even longer than that probably soon. But they produce on the order of hundreds of megabases of sequence in, in a matter of hours, actually. Um, and then uh, you also have now you know, your standard uh, applied bias. I guess Life Technologies owns these guys now, too. Um, the capillary base, the 3730. And that can produce read lengths out to seven or 800 bases. Um, and, uh, but it produces it on the order of, of kilobases of sequence at a time. Now, I mentioned this uh, Pacific Biosciences machine. This, this could potentially be a game changer. I think it might fall somewhere way out here, kind of get the benefit of kind of kilobases in read length, at least some of the reads that might come off of this, and producing you know, hundreds of gigabases of sequence at a, at a phenomenal rate. But uh, I don't believe you can actually buy one of these machines yet, where I do believe you can buy all of these types of machines uh, right now, even I think you can even buy this Helicos machine right now, as well. Um, so, uh, and and again, my throughput is is not only how much sequence can you generate, but also by some sort of you know standard unit time or cost here. So this is kind of the the mainstay of of these technologies, and we'll now kind of go through each of these these three technologies, um, th these three main technologies um, through the rest of my talk. Okay, so. Uh, something that's common to all of these different methods, there are little things that, that are, are different, but I wanted to separate this out from the three different methods that, that I'll highlight in detail, are really how do you prepare a library of, of DNA to, to sequence? Um, and it all, so this, again, this single molecule or a clonally amplified version of a single molecule starts with taking your DNA, what, whatever that might be, and uh, shearing it up into smaller pieces of DNA. All of these methods require pieces of DNA that are much smaller than the size of a genome, uh, on the order of hundreds of bases in, in length. And then you add uh, some sort of uh, proprietary or not so proprietary anymore adapters onto the ends of these, these uh, little short pieces of DNA that you want to sequence. Um, and then you select for, for adapters, by in, in, and each of the methods has a, their, their trick on doing this, for molecules that only have an A adapter and a B adapter. So you have to have different adapters on each end. And then, again, what, what differs with each of these different methods is uh, you then attach these uh, uh, adapter ligated sequences to some sort of solid surface. That could be a glass flow cell that I'll show you in a little bit. It, it might be some sort of um, uh, bead. Uh, that, that has uh, little sequences on it that are complementary to one of these adapters. And then you use the, the uh, whatever method to actually look at those molecules that you've stuck onto this solid surface uh, and sequence and obviously analyze all of them. Okay. Um, now, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the ability to generate what are called paired end reads. So these are two reads that um, are physically linked to each other by some distance apart. And in various, for various techniques, um, it's useful to know this information, where you might have uh, uh, 50 or 100 bases over here, 50 or 100 bases over here, and then some fixed space in between uh, that separates where you don't know what the sequence is. And that could be very helpful, especially for genome assembly methods to, to get this DNA. The challenge is that um, except for the Illumina-based technology, which allows you to inherently sequence the both ends of a fragment that's 
somewhere on the order of 400 bases in length. Um, the other two methods require you to, to do uh, experimental tricks to get two ends of DNA that are normally far apart from each other very close to each other. So what this slide does is, is actually um, describe to you some of those tricks that, that can be used to bring two pieces of DNA close to each other for sequencing. Uh, and actually, this slide was made by uh, two people in my lab, Andrew Young and, and Hatija. Um, and uh, this, this is how, you, how it works. So you, you shear up your genomic DNA into fragments that are of the, the size that you want to get this, this pairing information. And then uh, one method of, of dealing with um, trying to get these, these uh, ends close to each other is by using an adapter that has the sequence of uh, a restriction enzyme called ECOOP15I. This is one of these type 2S restriction enzymes that recognizes a site over here but actually cuts some 20 or 25 bases away uh, from its recognition site. And uh, you actually create molecules that have your fragment in it and then this adapter that um, has these, these eco P15I sites on it and also set, uh, have some biotin on, on the inside of it. And so then you actually digest the, these circularized molecules with eco P15I and you, using the biotin you could uh, capture out these uh, sequences that then represent a little bit of sequence from one end of a 2 to 3 kb molecule and a little bit of sequence from the other end of a 2 to 3 kb molecule. But this molecule is now on the order of a couple hundred bases. So it can, it can now be sequenced either from one end and then another end on, let's say, the Illumina platform, or what the other platforms do is they just do one single read and they sequence right through this entire thing. So they actually, you throw out all of the sequence in the middle and, and then you get the second read over here. And informatically, you have to tease this, this bit out for both the 454 and the, uh, and the solid-based uh, methods. So this kind of highlights it again. Again, the Illumina plat this is kind of focused uh, Illumina-centric right now. It's, it happens to be the method that I use the most, so I'm, but I'm trying to be unbiased in my presentation of, of these three methods here to highlight all the advantages of these different methods. But the Illumina method, you can actually sequence in on this side and then redo the reaction and sequence in again on the, this other side. Whereas, the, um, And then you can take advantage of this uh, but you can't do this for any more than 400 bases. So if you want to get larger insert libraries, then you've got to do the tricks uh, uh, like this. And there are other ways of doing this now as well, where you sequence in 27, 27 bases, and then you redo the sequence on the other side for 27 bases. Or again, what the other methods would do is just sequence straight through. Uh, but now you have the identity of this fragment, the end of this fragment, and the end of this fragment, which were originally 2 to 3 kb away from each other. Okay, so uh, another uh, bit of uh, technology that can be quite useful is to uh, index uh, some of these reads. And because the capacities of these machines are so large, it might be that one lane or one spot of, uh, of one of these runs is producing way more data than you want to get. But what you might be after are data from a small locus on hundreds of samples. Well, there, there are ways where you can uh, uh, identify which sample comes from which uh, um, which read comes from which sample um, by adding on kind of an index of, of a short piece of DNA. And each method does this a little bit differently. The way that the uh, Illumina-based method works is you add in these, these adapters, your sequence of interest is over here, so you would kind of do read one. And then uh, instead of doing the second paired end read, you actually, your read two is on the same strand but in a different location. Uh, that is a key, um, you actually sequence six bases, and each of these indices uh, would represent a different sample that you have added one of these indices on. So you can kind of deconvolute which read comes from which uh, sample after you've pooled all of these samples together. And then you could go and resynthesize your second strand and do read two, and I'll describe some of this in a little bit more detail. But I wanted to point out that this is now useful, although you have to weigh the, the advantages and disadvantages of just simply doing many samples and, and overkill on, on the number of reads and bases that you would get for each sample versus the upfront cost of spending extra time indexing your libraries, because you still have to make uh, one library per sample. And, each of the technologies are working on ways of pooling these things at an earlier stage so you don't have to treat each sample separately until a certain point. Okay. So uh, we're going to move on to uh, some new sequencing platforms. Okay. Um, I'm starting to wonder if, if this is the right talk. I think 
that this is the right version. Okay, so let's talk about um, the uh, 454 sequencing platform. Um, this is uh, a, um, I got a little bit taken back because I thought I had a different slide in here, so bear with me for a second. Okay, this is the, the article that came out describing the, the 454 sequencing technology. Uh, again, the, the machine is, is over here, so you can read in detail this method. This method is, is fundamentally based on pyro sequencing, and uh, the way that, that uh, this works is uh, you actually create, um, uh, you create your library like I described in the, the few slides beforehand, and uh, you end up annealing um, single-stranded DNA um, to uh, these little uh, styrofoam beads that have complementary DNA molecules on them. And what you end up trying to create are, they call this a, an, an emulsification of a, it's kind of an oil-water mix. And you try and get one bead and one DNA molecule in one uh, water bubble. Um, and so you can imagine trying to get the ratios of your beads and your DNA molecules um, and the right amount of oil and water together, and you mix this up in a certain way, and hopefully you get some proportion of little bubbles that have this in it. And inside of these beads are also attached to it um, the reagents necessary to do um, a, a little kind of PCR inside to clonally amplify that single molecule that then attaches to various other sites uh, within uh, this styrofoam bead. And then you can kind of break this off, and then you have a bead that's got hopefully one molecule that's been clonally amplified all over it. And then these beads, okay, right, so each bubble contains a different fragment, and then each of these beads kind of goes into what they call a picotiter plate. So you hopefully are getting uh, one of these little beads into one of these little wells, and then these little wells get kind of packed with enzymes that allow you to do the, the sequencing reaction at the end. So rather than dealing with kind of a 96-well plate, you're dealing with kind of this picotiter plate that then gets imaged by a, by a camera, and uh, however many, you know, you can kind of um, gauge the throughput by however many of these molecules or these beads you can create from a single molecule that then gets stuck in one of these individual wells. So there are pl various places that you can optimize to try and get uh, as much sequence out of this as, as you possibly can. So the, again, the idea here is rather than going from this old capillary-based way of dealing with 96 reads per run, you're dealing with kind of hundreds of thousands of reads per run. And this is just a, uh, showing you the, the actual physical hardware uh, that these picotiter plates are, are designed for. Okay, so this is a pyrosequencing reaction um, that uh, works a little bit differently than, than a dideoxy method. Um, the, the reaction is described over here, but the idea is that um, you end up putting in kind of your A, and then you let it, um, you let it do its thing, and then um, what is measured is the, an emission of light. Um, and the amount of light that's emitted is proportional to the number of A, C's, G's, or T's in a row that could be extended. So you can only extend with the nucleotides that you have in there. And that's kind of highlighted a little bit, and on this, uh, what I, th I think this is actually a nice review of pyro sequencing. So you can imagine if you uh, have a, a, you kind of read these, they're called flowgrams. If you, re you read these a little bit differently than, than some of the other chromatograms you're used to seeing. So if you stick in an A, it might uh, light up to, you know, one unit of, of A, so you know that you only have one A here. But let's say uh, you then stick in G, and it lights up, uh, you know, four times as much as this A, so you know that there are actually four Gs there instead of one G. And then you add in a T, and uh, you get a measure of one, one unit of T. If you add in a C, maybe there's nothing there, so there's no C coming out next. You add in the A again, and there's nothing there. Then you add in the G, it looks like there's two Gs, and so forth. So you're constantly, you're adding an A, G, T, C, A, G, T, C, and you're measuring how many A, Cs, Gs, or Ts were extended by the, the amount of light. So inherently, you can imagine that if you have long homopolymers, uh, this is going to become quite a challenge because maybe you can kind of jump nicely between one, two, three, or four Gs, but kind of beyond that, it becomes very difficult to accurately measure. Do I have 10 Gs or 11 Gs and so forth? And sometimes this isn't as important um, uh, in, uh, in trying to find SNPs, let's say, but it can certainly uh, become a, a challenge. And obviously, this is one of the main areas that 454 is working towards being able to resolve is to better, better accurately call these homopolymers. 
Um, so this is actually what uh, kind of the, the data look like coming off of um, an actual 454 instrument, and they've kind of colored them in, in different ways. Uh, and so you can kind of see what they, where, how they draw their one MERS, two MERS, three MERS, and so forth. And, and this all comes off and then is converted into, into the sequences. So uh, just to kind of briefly summarize on the, the 454 technology, kind of the runtime is roughly eight hours. And it produces on the order of, of hundreds of megabases of sequence for kind of several thousand dollars. I think the number is somewhere in the $10,000 range to, to do one of these runs. Right now, I think the read lengths are in kind of the three to 400 base range. And this is kind of one of the most kind of mature of these new sequencing technologies. It was one of the first ones to kind of be released to the market that was different than a dideoxy sequencing platform. And again, these, these homopolymers can be an issue. You can really use this method for, for many different types of, of uh, applications, particularly de novo sequencing, because you have these longer read lengths that allow you to bridge uh, repetitive regions and uh, make assemblies better with, with the longer reads. But again, uh, the stuff up here is kind of the least important as far as accuracy. Uh, the, the, what I would want to impress upon you is the order of magnitude here. It's not taking days to, to do this run. It's taking hours. Uh, we're generating hundreds of megabases of sequence, not hundreds of gigabases of sequence. And we're getting read lengths in the hundreds of base pairs, not in the tens of base pairs. So that's the take-home message of what a 454 instrument can do for you. It's kind of nice that you, you know, within a, the next day you have the sequence of hundreds of megabases of DNA um, in, a, in a matter of hours. And uh, <coughs> it is, it is uh, a, at a mature level where um, things are working most of the time. You know, the, the kits are, are quite nice and it's not a tinker toy type of an instrument now. It's, it's very hardened and, and quite a, a nice instrument. Uh, this is just to highlight some of the applications that have been done early on. They were able to actually sequence Neanderthal DNA um, with using this method. I actually think this guy looks like Kelsey Grammer a little bit. Not this one, but this one definitely does. Um, yeah, Kelsey Grammer with a mullet. That's funny. <laughs> um, okay. Um, the other thing that was done with, with a 454 instrument was uh, uh, generating Jim Watson's sequence, and this became a kind of a political or a very... Uh, I shouldn't say political, um, just a, a nice news article and a hubbub of, uh, you know, handing somebody's gen genome on a DVD over to, to Jim Watson. He was one of the first people to kind of publicly announce and make his genome kind of publicly available. The only thing he didn't want to make available were the, uh, the loci that can uh, show predisposition to Alzheimer's disease because he had uh, relatives in his family who uh, um, had had this disease and he didn't want to know uh, a, you know, he's already in his 80s, I believe, and he didn't want to know uh, this, uh, that locus either. Um, you can actually go to a Cold Spring Harbor website and um, uh, use a genome browser to view Jim Watson's personal genome, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this uh, later on in, in my talk. Um, okay, so this is my child, and this is being used as a way of just waking you up a little bit because we've got still a long talk ahead of us, and uh, I am a doting father, and I wanted to see what she looked like on this big screen as well. I think she's kind of cute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now we're moving on to the Illumina Genome Analyzer, formerly known as Selexa. I've actually got a picture of this instrument when it was a Selexa instrument, but it's now owned by Illumina. Um, this um, method works... Again, my slides are not in the order that I think they're in my head, but we're eventually getting to all of the slides, so I apologize a little bit. Uh, this method works as follows. You kind of do the sample prep again the way I described with getting an adapter on, uh, an A adapter on one side, a B adapter on the other side, and then you um, uh, attach these single molecules to a solid surface that, that has uh, the complementary to, to one or the, the other uh, adapter side. And you create what are called clusters of these single molecules. So they, this is a cutesy animation. So these things attach over here. And they go through what's called a bridge amplification. And the bridge is really the fact that the, the other um, PCR primer is actually attached to the surface of the, um, the, the solid surface of, this, of what's called a flow cell. So you create what they call a bridge. You then create the, uh, a replica of this sequence and then kind of go through, that gets washed away, and then you go through this kind of clonal amplification. So you can create these clusters of approximately 1,000 molecules separated out on this flow cell. And then you go through this kind of 
uh, reversible terminator uh, chain sequencing and, and obviously go through various bioinformatics analyses. So this reversible terminator, I want to go through this a little bit in more detail because it's actually subtly uh, but importantly different and actually the whole reason why this machine actually works and is proprietary on what's, what's behind all of this but um, is really the, the main reason why um, uh, this machine has such a, a high throughput. So you start with your, your DNA molecule and, and your, your known adapter sequence. Uh, you, you end up, you know, um, annealing a primer, and then you've got, a, in the reaction, you've got your polymerase attached, and then all the A, C's, G's, and T's, all the different nucleotides, each one has a different color. And what you, but these nucleotides are modified in such a way that um, the polymerase can only extend by one base. You cannot extend this any more than one base. Uh, and this is what the, what's the key to their, their chemistry working. You can then actually remove all the unincorporated nucleotides, uh, use a laser to measure was this an A, C, G, or T, because each of these molecules, uh, nucleotides, has a different uh, fluorophore attached to it, and you detect that signal. You can then reverse the termination on this, and this is, again, way cool. I don't know how it actually works, but it works, and allow extension again by one and only one base. You then measure, you then strike a laser at it, detect what that next molecule was, and uh, so forth. And then you could sequence the, the next molecule. And then you continue on down the line, uh, and, and you're able to do this uh, for, you know, tens of bases at a time. Um, so you're sequencing uh, kind of a, a single base at a time, but you're doing this for literally millions of molecules at a time. And so uh, the you know, each, each company is going to tell you they can do one thing better than another. So the, essentially, you've you got all four nucleotides in one reaction, uh, and they, of course, don't have these problems with these homopolymers. You can kind of keep going, uh, and that, that isn't an issue. Of course, there might be other subtle issues with, with uh, sequencing uh, using uh, the Illumina-based platform. I don't think I have the data showing here, but, but sometimes extreme biases in GC content can uh, affect the... the um, the yield of, of uh, DNA that you can get out of some of these machines, uh, it's relatively minor, although it could be substantial on a genome-wide scale. But these are the things that, you know, just like 454 is working on improving their homopolymer identification, Illumina is working on minimizing the, this GC bias. So this is what kind of the machines look like, at least yesterday. Um, they're going to look very different again two weeks from now, uh, or maybe even today. I think they're starting to release some new machines. So you've got this thing called a flow cell. It's got eight lanes in it, so you can run up to eight samples before you do your indexing. And then right now they have kind of reagents that allow you to index up to 12 samples at a time. I think they're going up to 96 at a time. Uh, and it really is a, a glorified kind of two microscope slides that are sandwiched together uh, by uh, these grooves that are shown here. And then kind of the machine attaches at the beginning side and the other side to flow liquids through uh, this, what they call a flow cell. And there's like a, I think it's made of acrylamide or something, some sort of matrix inside, solid matrix that they attach the, um, the different oligos to that, that allow the single molecules to, to attach to it. Um, they have a separate machine over here that, uh, in my mind, looks like a futuristic Flash Gordon-like machine um, that the flow cell attaches to. And, and this is kind of like a glorified PCR machine where uh, the PCR is and liquid handler. So you throw in your reagents, you put your um, flow cell attached to this, and it's uh, sitting on top of a Peltier unit, which can heat and cool the, uh, um, the flow cell as it's flowing different reagents through to amplify these, uh, these clusters. This flow cell then goes on to this machine, which is the actual sequencer, and this sequencer is really a glorified microscope and liquid handler. So it's got a, a stage in here that you attach the microscope to that can move around with an objective and a camera and a laser inside of it, and then reagents are flowed through this, and one cycle is sequenced at a time, and then images are captured. And really, the, 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 um, the bottleneck in generating a lot of sequence um, or, or the, the, in the time to generate a lot of sequence is in imaging. We can only image so fast uh, in, with, with today's hardware. So what I want to impress upon is that the old school way of doing things has been, and the tried and true way of doing things has been with dideoxy Sanger sequencing, and we generate these chromatographs. We're changing the fundamental unit of what is the primary data. And the primary data are now these pretty little spots, like looking up at a, at a sky, and where each of these individual spots represent a different clonally amplified molecule. And you sequence these in parallel. So you can imagine you need to take 
hundreds of pictures like this uh, per flow cell. Uh, because uh, it's something like, I think today it's like 100 tiles per lane, and there's eight lanes, so um, well, actually I think it's now 120 tiles per lane, so you've got like 960 uh, images that you need to take times four because you need to do an A, C, G, and a T image, and then you have to do the bioinformatics to sandwich all these together. So this is kind of a beautified taking the A, C, G, and T and colorizing each one differently, so you can see that uh, different molecules would, would have an A, C, G, or T at a certain base length. So this is just kind of a close-up, kind of showing you how you would actually read this for two different uh, clusters. So I've circled this upper cluster over here and this lower cluster over here. This is the same spot on a, uh, in an image uh, at, done at different cycles. So at cycle one, you can read what the color is. I'm actually red-green colorblind, so the, it's difficult for me to see the difference between the T's I know. I think it's the C's that are red as well. So I can't tell the difference, but thankfully the computer can. Uh, and most of you can. So you kind of read what color this is, and then you go through the single base extension again, and you can read what, what color uh, this base is, and then you do a single base extension again, you do what this color is, and then you can read out uh, at each cycle uh, what, the, what the base position is. So you can imagine the bioinformatics, uh, for lack of a better term, we'll call them headaches, that are involved in stacking you know, 960 images for A, C, G, and T for cycle one, and then for A, C, G, and T for cycle two, you're generating terabytes of images that need to be stacked on top of each other. So for each image, you want to localize and find the same, same cluster, because so, uh, you don't want to be jumping from one cluster to another, and, and then calling these bases. And this is what the, what the Illumina machine does. And this is how it's able to sequence millions of millions, tens of millions, or hundreds of millions of molecules at the same time. The catch is that you're getting 50, 100 base reads out of this. You're not getting the three to 400 base reads that you can from, a, from the 454 pyro sequencing instrument. Okay, so uh, again, this is, this is the already outdated slide of, of numbers, but we gotta throw them up for relative terms anyway. So you're generating, nowadays you can put up to kind of in the order of 24 to 36 million molecules. Uh, uh, I think that's per lane. Uh, so each lane uh, can, so over eight lanes, you can yield, you know, over a quarter of a billion molecules. Um, and you're producing data kind of at a rate of kind of five to six gigabases a day. So to generate kind of uh, 100 base paradigm reads, this is a 10-day run. So this is a substantial amount of time. And of course, you know, you, you're, you're investing that amount of time. You don't want anything to go wrong in, in that length of time. Um, but, you know, you can, you can gauge this instrument uh, towards the experiment that you want to do. Sometimes all you're after are lots of different counting experiment molecules. So kind of 35 or 36 bases is enough to find a unique position in a genome uh, for the most part. But other times you want to do a variation type of experiment and the yield that you get out of one run is more important to you. And there you might want to extend that out to all the way to 100 bases. And again, maybe getting the paired end data is something that you want to do as well. So this would add, add time. But you can kind of, with today's chemistry that's, that's commercially available, you can kind of generate up to 50 gigabases of sequence in one run, which I think is pretty impressive. When I gave this talk, I think a year and a half ago, we were at like a gigabase and maybe two gigabases. So the, I, again, to, to give you an idea of the, the rapid, rapidly moving technologies here. But wait, they've just released a new instrument, right? So everything I've told you is now being transitioned. So I just want to give you some highlights. I think this instrument is literally just released like yesterday uh, that you can now buy this machine. Uh, uh, they're still going to be supporting this, this genome analyzer, um, but uh, for really super high throughput, they've now kind of uh, changed things up a bit and created a new machine. They call this thing HiSeq 2000. And uh, the, I guess the nice thing is that it's actually still based on the fundamental chemistry that I described. So that's not changing. What they've done is kind of you know, made a Ferrari of optics and imaging uh, inside of this thing so that they can image faster, better, higher density, more surface area, and so forth to generate lots of data. They're also actually um, be able to run kind of two flow cells at the same time. So while one is doing the imaging, the other one can do the chemistry. And some other technologies I'll describe, the solid kind of takes advantage of this as well. 
So the way that this machine differs, I just want to briefly touch on this here. Uh, you can kind of run two flows at the, at the same time. Uh, again, the flow cells are bigger. The other kind of cool thing that they take advantage of is not only are you imaging a larger surface area, but you're actually, actually now imaging, you generate clusters um, on both sides of the flow cell. So they're actually now able to focus on the top side of the flow cell, scan that, and then refocus on the bottom side of the flow cell and scan that. So right there, they've kind of doubled their capacity on, on what they've done. And so they try and, like each method's trying to take advantage of these little tricks inherent to their, their method. Um, and again, uh, the main improvements here are in kind of the hardware in that, in that new instrument. So they're trying to release this thing, oh, we're already in mid-February, um, at uh, 100 to 125 gigabases per flow cell. This is, I'll describe this a little bit later. This is actually enough to analyze uh, one whole genome uh, when you already have a reference sequence for with which to realign. And we'll go over why this is uh, the amount of sequence that you'd want to get. Um, the the runtime that they now have, rather than 10 days for one flow cell, is kind of eight days for two flow cells. So the, and they've up kind of, the, so their data rate is now, you know, from five to six gig a day, upwards of like 25 gig a day. So you're essentially getting two whole genomes in an eight-day period of time, which is kind of neat. And of course, the way they're building this hardware, they're trying to scale this up. So this is probably the beginning of their kind of foray into making things faster, better, cheaper as well. Again, the reason I'm showing this to you is not to advertise the next latest greatest, but is to kind of impress upon you how rapidly moving this technology is. And where this really becomes a nightmare is uh, uh, all on the informatics, because, or I shouldn't say all, but one of the areas is, is on the informatics, because we, as informaticians, start to understand the nuances of a certain data type. And we got used to, with the, um, with the dideoxy sequencing, understanding that really, really, really well. And now we're being asked to completely change pipelines and transform things you know, over months of periods of time rather than years of periods of time. So this is causing all sorts of headaches. You can imagine uh, places and institutions uh, that, are, that are using dozens of these machines at a time, how quickly they need to refine and change their pipelines as well. So this is, this is a big challenge. Okay, so let's talk about the third main machine that, I, that uh, is out there. Uh, this is uh, a machine, they call it solid. It has something to do with, I always forget these lingos, but the LI is for ligation. Um, it was previously owned by Applied Biosystems, now Life Technologies. This is all rapidly changing. And this is what kind of this machine looks like. It actually has a mini Linux cluster underneath it to be able to handle all the images that are being produced so rapidly. Each machine is, has to figure out how to deal with the processing of all of these, these terabytes of raw data that are coming off uh, in a slightly different way. And, and that's one of the major challenges that all these methods have to deal with, not just th this method here. So this is actually quite challenging. I have to kind of, I had to like relearn this again to, for this lecture because it's very confusing to me. But it's, uh, the, one of the things that they highlight is, is this two-base encoding technology. Um, what happens is they generate a number of probes that where, where the, the first two bases um, are, are what's known. They're only using four different colors. Um, so there are many two bases, many different combinations of two bases that are blue. Uh, so forth, and, and green, and, and, and so forth. But they know what they are. And, um, and then they have uh, kind of a random five bases over here, and then I think they use kind of universal, like, inosine bases for the last. So they have got this little, what is it? I think a seven mer or an eight mer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So an eight mer. Um, and they create all of these different probes. And what uh, happens in this kind of two-base encoding technology is that what you're reading off of this are colors uh, that represent two bases at a time. Now, the key to decoding all of this, so, so this is actually the, the, this is the first part in knowing how to decode what the bases are from what they call color space. You kind of, if, you re, if you're reading a red, you can say, okay, uh, if uh, the first base is an A, then the second base is a T. Uh, if the first base is a C, then the second base is a G. But again, it, so this color a sequence of colors could actually be up to four different sequences. And the key here is that you actually need to know the identity of that first base to be able to deconvolute what the colors, uh, what the sequences of the, the other colors. Now, there are various bits of lingo here that, that show how 
doing this two-base encoding, especially for looking for variant detection, could be advantageous because you have to have a specific sequence of color change events that occur, not just one, that are valid for a particular SNP. Whereas other methods, uh, you, if, there's a, if there's a base change, you don't know if that's an error. You, you have an idea if that's an error based on the quality of that read, but uh, there's no other sort of error checking validation in there. And so one of the ways that they pitch this two-base encoding uh, in this color space analysis is that um, you can have these, you have to have this um, kind of uh, corresponding other color change to call a valid variation. So this is another kind of way, way that this works. Again, it's a very similar uh, in uh, template preparation to the, uh, to the 454 method using these, um, uh, um, the, the oil water uh, emulsion mixes uh, where you try and get one molecule, one bead into one water drop in an oil mix. And, uh, but what, what happens is kind of in round one, you, you ligate a, a primer um, where you kind of know what, I don't know if you know what the first base is at this point is, but you know it overlaps kind of one of the one of the positions where you know what that base is, and then you kind of add in one of those those uh, that mix of of adapters that have uh, the first two bases where where it's known, and then other random bases after that, and uh, the ligation occurs. Um, this, this ligation when it kind of seals off this ligation, it emits one of these fluorophores. And this is where their kind of proprietary technology comes. And then you kind of read what that, that fluorophore is. Um, and yep, so that's what's showing over here. So when the ligation happens, you can kind of excite this. And then um, it, so it stays here, whereas all the others get washed away. So I take it back. It wasn't the ligation event that, that causes the emission. It's, it's, wa it's keeping it there so that it can be excited. And then you, you measure what, what got incorporated. And then you kind of cleave this off and then continue down and do this for, let's say, seven or so cycles. And so what you end up getting on this first round are the positions of you know, the first two bases, then you skip three bases, and then you get the other two bases, then you skip three bases, and you get the other two bases. So that's what you've kind of got after doing this first round of, of sequencing. But then you kind of strip this away, and you repeat this with the primer that sits n minus one, so one back from that. And you do that whole sequencing bit again to get another two bases that are then kind of overlapping with each other. So each position ends up getting kind of sequenced twice. And you kind of uh, build this, this whole thing up so then you get these kind of color space reads. Uh, and you can then use their alignment algorithms to align the color space reads to a color space genome and figure out where all these reads align. And then this, uh, this idea that I was describing to you is that if um, you have a SNP in a particular region, uh, it's great that you've got you know half the reads having one color, half the reads having another color, but you also have to see this this corresponding change at the adjacent base as well with the, with this two color encoding. Whereas something like this would be considered an error uh, because there is no uh, cor corresponding uh, color change at, with the base afterwards. So this is kind of the advantage of of using this this kind of color space way of dealing with things. You can imagine this is a little bit of a headache trying to deal with your raw data. Uh, so it becomes, it's, it's not uh, as, as easily plug and playable as we would like to uh, be able to run a bunch of genome analyzers and then go, oh, no, wait, I just want to run, run the same sample on these solid machines as well. It's a kind of a completely different way of dealing with the bioinformatics. So it's, it's quite a challenge. You've, uh, unfortunately, you end up kind of committing to one or another and, and make a substantial investment in the bioinformatics and learning how to do one method or another method. So the already outdated slide of numbers here, uh, you're producing, uh, and this is kind of the, the trickery that we have to be careful about, kind of currently I think they're producing somewhere on the order of 30 to 50 gigabases per run, um, but this is, this is a two flow cell system, so that's kind of on the order of 15 to 25 gigabases per flow cell. Um, uh, they're, they're getting kind of 50 base read lengths, and I believe that's, that's kind of the, where they, they see their their read lengths going. Uh, uh, I think a, a very crude comparison, if you want to do, between a solid and an alumina would be the alumina is getting probably slightly longer read lengths, but not by orders of magnitude. But the solid is probably getting slightly more numbers of molecules being able to be sequenced. Um, the run times are a little bit longer than the genome analyzer. Uh, it's either seven days uh, for a single run, read or 14 days for a paired end read. Uh, and again, the reason why this is all outdated is because last week 
they just announced solid four rather than solid three. And so what they're now saying is getting on the order of, and I don't know if this is available now or about to be available, uh, but now they're announcing something on the order of 100 gigabases across two flow cells. So again, this is kind of 50 gigabases of flow cell. And the cost, the relative costs are about the same per flow cell if you think about it in an Illumina versus a, uh, um, uh, a solid type of platform. And, then the, and I, I just got this really from their website um, saying it's expandable to 300 gig in the future with some system upgrade they're calling like HQX or whatever, it's various lingos to the bit. And so this is apparently what this machine is going to look like. Okay, so this is the uh, outdated table. It's phenomenal to me that a publication from January of 2010 can already have an outdated table in here. But it's it still, again, gives you kind of the the rough relative terms over here of kind of the, the pros and the cons and what you might want to use uh, these different platforms for. So the, the 454 instrument is listed over here. Um, the Illumina GA2X is listed over here. Uh, so remember they're saying kind of 18 to 35 gigabases. Uh, I think we're now at more like 25 to 50 gigabases. Uh, these uh, AB is saying 30 to 50. It's more like 50 to 100. Uh, these machines are all roughly an order of magnitude about a two-bedroom apartment in Bethesda, I think, um, half a million dollars, uh, and kind of the, uh, it doesn't have how these work. So remember, this is, this is the pyro sequencing, this is the reversible terminator chemistry, and this is the ligation-based kind of two-base encoding. Um, okay, but uh, some other methods that I'm actually not going to talk about today are listed in this table. Uh, this is uh, actually kind of um, an open source version of a uh, solid instrument. It's, uh, they call it the pollinator, um, and it comes out of George Church's lab, um, and uh, you kind of build it, uh, or you, you buy the hardware, but then you kind of uh, purchase your own reagents and make your own reagents and kind of go through this and has relatively short reads, but can be quite useful kind of for, um, for kind of small scale types of things or, or trying to scale this out without being wed to a particular commercial company. And then this, this helosco heloscope um, instrument down here, which is really true single molecule sequencing. This, maybe you can get yourself a three or four bedroom place in Bethesda for, for that kind of money. Um, all right, so just quickly touch on uh, what's coming in the near future, uh, which is very different than the other. The reason why I didn't uh, take the time really right now to describe these other two methods is that they, they kind of are relatively similar to one of these other three methods that I went into detail. This specific biosciences instrument is something that we've been kind of watching for several years. They're claiming to have a, kind of a beta early access instrument in the next several months available. I think they're starting to generate data in-house for various collaborators. And the, the basic idea behind this is, I think, quite cool. You've got, um, so what do they call it? It's, they call it SMART technology, SMRT, which stands for, I think, single molecule real time. And they've got cool names for things. So they've got this, um, these little kind of uh, itsy bitsy wells that I think they call them uh, zero mode waveguides. It sounds like we're very much in the future here, but I'm sure it's got some physics property to it that means something that I don't quite understand. And what they've done is they've actually attached a polymerase to the base of one of these, what are they called, ZMWs. Um, and uh, then they, they also have these nucleotides that have a fluorophore attached to them. But I think the idea is that they're, where they're attached is, is they're not actually attached to the nucleotide, they're actually attached to the, the phosphate backbone of, of this or that, that triphosphate component. So what actually is happening is as a single molecule gets extended through this polymerase that's attached to this solid surface over here, um, the, uh, the fluorophore that's attached to it somehow gets excited because it's brought in close proximity to a laser that's also on the other side of where this polymerase is attached to. So you're, you kind of read off the fluorescence in kind of real time as a, as a single molecule is being synthesized through this polymerase. So you can imagine, I think this is kind of a close-up over here, single molecule goes through and the other side of this is probably some laser that's trying to capture the emission of a single molecule being extended. And so you end up sequencing this DNA kind of, I think it's on the order of like 10 bases a second or something like that of these molecules kind of coming through. And of course the idea is that if you can uh, capture the images or, or, or capture the fluorescence and read this off 
off of thousands or maybe up to millions of these individual zero mode waveguides at, at a time, you can really start to generate tons of data in a way that's a total game changer to all the other methods I just kind of described to you. And I think they're, they're saying that some of the reads that, are, that end up coming through this now can be up to, up, up to three kilobases in length. Of course, there's a wide distribution of read lengths that end up coming through because you've kind of randomly sheared your DNA. And I think one of the issues that they're dealing with, uh, just talking with some of my colleagues, is uh, the fact that uh, the laser ends up kind of frying this little polymerase over here. So it can only last for so long, and some of them can last longer than others through this, this uh, instrument. So this is kind of cool. And you can imagine they're kind of starting out producing a pretty high data error, uh, data rate that's kind of comparable to this new HiSeq machine. Uh, and I'm sure they're going to go upwards from there as well. But it, it sequences very differently than some of these other instruments. So I wanted to kind of touch on this a little bit and, and point this out to, to everybody. OK. Uh, something I'd like to touch on just a little bit, but I'm not going to go into detail because to me that would be a whole other lecture series, is the fact that these machines are producing orders of magnitude more data. And it requires you to be extremely nice to your IT folks. And uh, these are two of our IT and bioinformatician folks standing over what is now an antiquated analysis instrument for one of these genome analyzers over here. But he's looking big and strong, able to conquer all sorts of bioinformatics challenges. And um, uh, kind of what I wanted to touch on here is, is the, the data volumes are so massive. If you think about it on the order of kind of a per human genome, all of these instruments end up producing somewhere on the order of 15-ish of terabytes. This is kind of a back of the envelope calculation. 15 terabytes of raw data. And uh, until very recently, we actually had to capture and store that 15 terabytes of data and process it to get it down to some sort of usable form uh, that ended up being on the order of 100 gigabases of process data. What all of these companies are trying to do is pretend this part didn't actually exist and try and real time on the fly analyze the raw data so that what comes out the end of the instrument is really kind of the processed raw data that, and call this the new raw data. But the problem is that we don't know what are the important bits of information to store. We used to know that really, really well. We still know that really, really well with the capillary-based methods. We know the chromatograms. We know what is a good quality, what's a bad quality peak. And so we can throw away these chromatograms very soon after we've analyzed them uh, because we have a, a very accurate quality score that measures how accurate is that base call. We're still trying to learn that with all of these other, other instruments. And there are quality scores, but we don't know all, all us bioinformatics geeks don't necessarily trust them as much as we would like to trust them. So there's a whole kind of world of bioinformatics that's really trying to figure out what's the best way of going from 15 terabytes down to 100 gigabytes of, of data. Um, and a lot of people are starting to think about ways of, of using the cloud and the cloud computing. And, and this has a, a lot of advantages, uh, uh, but it makes, you know, uh, it used to be the fact that kind of any biologist that kind of picked up a, a learn how to program per, in Perl book over the course of a few months, uh, and my, that's myself included, became a card-carrying bioinformatician. And you can do all sorts of cool things. Uh, we're getting to the point where some of this stuff, you really need kind of a hardcore sci uh, computer scientist to, to be on your team to work with you, because th there, are, there are languages and ways of, of engineering systems that require much more sophisticated ways of doing things uh, than um, kind of a a fly-by-night bioinformatician can do, as, as I'll, I'll put it. Uh, the challenge with this, this concept of cloud computing is, wrong one, is as follows. So it used to be in kind of the, I'll call them the old school days, but kind of in the physics world where they know what data, you know, they're, they're working with these particle accelerators generating tons of data, but they process it on the fly and they know exactly what bits of data they need. Um, they, they, gener they end up getting a small amount of data that they need to kind of compute all sorts of things on. So what they end up doing is what's called kind of taking the data and moving it to wherever this very large computer cluster lived. And that was kind of the mode of, of working with things for a while. But now we're getting to a point where the data is so huge that the concept of trying to shove terabytes and terabytes of data up into this cloud is, is one of the biggest bottlenecks. And we're starting to think about ways of maybe we should move the, the compute over to where the data are being generated. So maybe you have a few massive centers around the world that are generating tons and tons of data, 
and you move your compute clusters over there and maybe make them kind of the open source way of doing things. And if uh, so, if if uh, you know the Broad Institute generated the 500 genomes that you want to analyze, rather than sucking the data from them and moving it to your local cluster or the BioWolf cluster over here, you actually log on to their systems and do it. I'm talking kind of hypothetically here, but that's the that's the general concept of what we're thinking about uh, in in the challenges. And hopefully, we'll get to a point where uh, the data aren't so huge, and we can be generating data for thousands of genomes, but uh, we're able to capture the important bits of what we need, not hundreds of gigabytes or even in terabytes of data. Okay, we're nearing the end. This is her seven days old on top of what used to be my former, my former baby, my espresso machine. And uh, hopefully you don't need coffee uh, to stay through with me, but I uh, would like to now finish up talking about some of the applications of all of these different technologies. Okay, so the first, uh, the first one that I wanted to uh, touch on that I mentioned earlier on is this concept of uh, counting-based experiments. Um, and I wanted to kind of quickly highlight how, how this kind of works. Let's say uh, you are a biologist and you're studying your favorite protein and you've raised this perfect antibody that can, that can highlight which parts of the genome your protein is binding to. Uh, well, you can use this in a kind of a chromatin IP experiment. Let's say these little orange bits represent those parts of the genome. You want to figure out where's your protein binding. So what you can do is kind of shear up your DNA into these small little fragments uh, in a way that's kind of cross-linked all the proteins to the DNA. You can then purify these fragments, and I think uh, Laura Elnitsky will be going into uh, detail on a lot of these types of experiments. But uh, let's go through this briefly just to highlight how this can be used on these sequencing platforms. You then isolate only the fragments that have uh, your protein bound to it using, let's say, your favorite antibody or the special antibody that you created. So now you can try and sequence the ends of all these DNA to figure out which are the bits of DNA that, that you actually enriched for. And so the idea is that um, you end up doing this for many different fragments, and in a particular place in the genome, you can align these reads. It's possible you might only be getting the identity of a short bit at the end over here, but these <coughs> fragments might actually pile up on each other such that the only thing in common with all of these fragments are the places where you're protein bound. And so this is, you can imagine generating kind of these peaks uh, that, that look like where uh, your protein is binding to DNA. And um, early on, you know, way back in 2007, uh, actually uh, one of our own colleagues, K.J. Zhao, uh, showed that uh, this type of analysis was very comparable to doing what used to be done, which was a chip-chip experiment, where you took that immunoprecipitated uh, DNA uh, and uh, hybridized it to a microarray that had tiled parts of the genome on it. Uh, so now you could kind of more accurately and maybe faster try and identify these places. And this became... Uh, dumb, dubbed uh, the chip-seq method rather than chip-chip method. Uh, this is also uh, another, um, early on was shown um, by another group uh, to correlate well with, with histone modifications, uh, whether it was chip-chip or chip-seq, you kind of see the similar pat profiles. Um, but where this method, so I'm going to uh, shift here now, where I think this, these types of methods are really becoming advantageous is in kind of the world of whole genome sequencing. Uh, where you can take a whole human genome and in a, um, a matter of days or weeks uh, generate enough data to identify virtually all of the variants between that genome and, an, and a, um, the reference genome. Um, there are actually, just to highlight kind of the first two, what are being dubbed as personal genomes being sequenced. I mentioned Jim Watson's genome. Also, Craig Venter's genome is, has now been publicly been made available, and in fact, it was the Solera assembly that was, that was generated uh, back um, when the Human Genome Project was generating its draft genome as well. So a lot of times in, in uh, current genome analyses, people will talk about subtracting out the differences that were identified from Watson and Venter, because we know those two. But there are others now being available as well. And in fact, the, another table in, in the, uh, the Metzger uh, review that I mentioned earlier on kind of lists a bunch of the, the whole genomes that are kind of available uh, to date and what platform they were sequenced on and, and kind of roughly how much money we think it costs to sequence them. And it ranges from on the order of kind of $70 million for Venter's genome using these 3730s all the way down to kind of, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for something using kind of the helicoast machine. And a lot of these, these machines today are now 
getting down into the tens of thousands of dollars per genome range. So what does, uh, this is what I wanted to talk about. What does whole genome really mean? And now this, this paper uh, uh, where I believe David Bentley, uh, who's now at Illumina, was one of the, the lead authors on this manuscript, really kind of set the stage for the fact that we need kind of 30x base-wise alignment coverage, depth of coverage on average across a genome to define that as being a whole genome. And I'll show you in the next slide why that's the case. So uh, this kind of ends up being because roughly 80-ish percent of, of the, the good data that you generate will be able to align to a genome, um, ends up being 90 gigabases of aligned sequence or 120 gigabases of kind of passing filter data. Uh, this also ends up being something on the order of 600 million paired end 100 base reads. And it also means we're realigning it back to the reference sequence. So when people talk about whole genome sequencing now, usually what they're referring to is not generating an assembly like we did for the human genome or, or other comparative genomics genomes. It refers to creating roughly 30x base-wise coverage with one of these new sequencing technology platforms and realigning it back to the human reference sequence. Uh, that, that is what we mean by kind of whole genome. And why, why do we say 30x? Well, along this, this is a figure from that Bentley paper. Um, along the x-axis is kind of average read depth, so 5, 10, 15, 20, all the way out to 30 or 35x, and then kind of the number of known SNPs that were, were identified. Um, obviously, uh, very quickly, you can identif accurately identify homozygous SNPs. Uh, the challenge is, is in uh, identifying virtually all of the heterozygous SNPs uh, to uh, get uh, enough observations to accurately know that there's a heterozygous call at a particular region. You need more than just a few reads. Um, and so they, they kind of came out with this, this uh, plateau in the curve of all the SNPs being right around um, 30, 30x coverage. Uh, and again, this just kind of shows um, the, how the data become less discordant out at kind of 30x coverage. I won't go into the details of these figures, but uh, you can certainly read up on them in this manuscript. But that's where we get kind of this 30x coverage. Now, of course, this might this is for your average diploid genome. What happens if you uh, actually start sequencing uh, cancer genomes? Uh, they might not be diploid in many places. And this is really uh, where I'm going now is kind of the, the future. And there's been some recent publications showing people sequencing um, both uh, what they think is the normal genome of an individual, and then purifying the cancer cells from a particular tumor and sequencing the genome of the tumor. And now you have a really close match to that tumor uh, as far as understanding what are the differences in that tumor that made that a tumor, and not just what are the differences in that individual, like trying to subtract out Venter and Watson, but you can really get a, a close idea of what are the differences in that tumor that may, may have caused that tumor to actually grow and really shed a lot of light on tumor biology. So the idea uh, behind that type of an experiment, um, oh, and I should just mention this is one of the, the first papers from Tim Lay and the, and the group out at WashU, uh, the WashU Genome Center, Elaine Martis and, and Rick Wilson uh, run that center, um, as the, the first done on an Illumina platform. The idea behind this is you take just as I was saying, I should have just went to this slide and said it, uh, takes a normal sample, a tumor sample, sequence it on these, what, are, what they did was on these genome analyzers. So you have essentially two whole genomes that you've sequenced, and then you kind of compare and look for the tumor-specific variation. So this is uh, kind of impressive because they this publication, I believe, occurred, I'm, I'm forgetting dates, I apologize. This was December, November of 2008, so a year ago, okay? And it took them, uh, I think this is kind of impressive, uh, 98 runs for the tumor sample and kind of 34 Illumina runs for the skin sample. So you can imagine how much time it took to generate these data. They were generating over the course of a year, I believe, uh, was the amount of time it took to, to generate all, all of these data. And then they were able to identify all the variants. Um, in their, their uh, tumor genome, which is shown in red over here. And then, again, one of the comparisons they made was, you know, here's the Venter genome, here's the Watson genome, how do they kind of overlap? Here are the numbers. But you're still left with a, a large number of variants, over 1.7 million, that are specific to just the, in, the tumor in that individual. So what, what really counts is to be able to do the comparison. This is kind of a flow chart taken from their paper, where you take the 3.8 million variants that were identified in their tumor, and the first thing that you end up doing is subtracting out 
um, all of the, the, uh, the variants that were also identified in their normal sample. So now rather than dealing with 1.7 million that are you know, not Inventor and, um, and Watson, now you're down to 63,000 that are kind of tumor specific. And they kind of go through trying to find you know, ones that are novel and not in, um, uh, not in uh, other databases like dbSNP. They try and then go down and rule out things that are in non-genic regions because uh, people find it rather challenging to study non-coding DNA. We know a lot about coding sequence, so we can really boil down all of that sequencing down to kind of 241 variants, and they look at synonymous and unsynonymous things and end up with kind of eight validated ones. So it's a, it's, this is really kind of, I think, showing how it took a, a lot of effort two years ago to do this and what they got out of it because they didn't know where to look were kind of eight validated somatic variants. Now, the, the, again, the field is moving so rapidly that today we could do this on, on the order of two runs. And we're working on ways of being able to get through this type of a variant analysis in, in a more routine way. This isn't routine yet, but uh, this is what's kind of coming. And I believe that the next time I give this lecture, I will be talking not so much about all the technologies, but talking about how do we start doing these types of pipelines in a more automated way, and what are the patterns of variation that we can find with all, all of these uh, different genomes that we're now able to sequence. Another uh, example that I wanted to highlight, because it, it gives you an idea, this was now, I believe it came out in, um, I don't think the date's on this one, unfortunately, <laughs> um, uh, back in uh, late 2009. So a year later, they were now able to sequence, um, I, I don't have the, the raw data showing over here, but I believe they were able to do this in about a dozen runs. So down from you know, 100 runs to 30-something runs to now a dozen runs, and today we're at, at kind of two to three runs. So uh, things are kind of really on a downward trajectory. And one of the things that they did uh, by comparing this uh, melanoma tumor cell line to uh, a match normal cell line was to start to define what it meant to be a somatic variant. And what they, what they dubbed as a somatic variant was saying we needed uh, three high-quality reads in the tumor to, show, to identify that variant and also have a minimum of 10x coverage in the normal and no evidence of that variant. Now, this is a relatively crude way of doing things, and they went through uh, some validation to show that this was a relatively reasonable approach. But you can still imagine how crude this might be, and we really need to start defining the, uh, the basis of, um, of how to accurately call somatic variants, because this is going to be a big way of, of, uh, of I think, unleashing kind of tumor biology. Um, the nice thing about doing uh, a tumor and a normal on the same platform is the fact that kind of systematic biases and errors that are inherent to a platform and alignment method and so forth are kind of uh, washed out. And so while you might identify certain variants in both, um, you might not care because what, you, what you're really after are the variants that are specific to your tumor sample. Um, Great. So I actually did have this in, in here. Okay. So so they ended up um, talking about the, the, uh, the validation that I was mentioning. Um, they en ended up identifying something on the order of 30,000 uh, somatic variants. Uh, 42 of the 48 were actually uh, previously known somatic variants. And uh, if they go back and look at another, I think, five of these, uh, it looks like the chromatograph actually does show evidence for it after all, uh, but the other one is still inconclusive. This is a, in a talk that I heard about these data. Um, and then they were able to just pick randomly, I think, 470 of them and uh, verify that 452 of those 470 that they identified by Sanger sequencing were, in fact, somatic variants. And so they talk about having roughly an 88% sensitivity with a 3% false positive rate. The other kind of neat thing about doing this on a melanoma sample is that the, the mutation profile was really reflective of, of the C to T conversions that, that's known with UV damage. So that was kind of a cool, cool thing that they showed in, in this paper. Uh, uh, other things that you can do, I won't go into detail here, about uh, this, uh, these, these types of approaches are really looking at kind of translocations and copy number variants, especially when you get that pairing information. You can identify breakpoints in, in various genomes and where you might have amplifications and deletions. And if you correlate that to various genes, you can obviously, uh, you know, uncover tons of information about doing all of this. This is kind of a, a nice 
uh, plot uh, through a program that's available to try and summarize a genome's worth of data, both in kind of copy number variants where SNPs are along the outer side, where translocations occur uh, along the inside. It's kind of a, a nifty little program. Um, but obviously <laughs> where, where, where people are going now is not looking at one tumor normal pair, but really trying to compare um, dozens and maybe hundreds and thousands of tumor normal pairs or, or thousands of tumors to really identify those variants that tend to be uh, in common with many, many types of tumors of, of the same type or maybe uh, across many different types of tumors. I, I really believe this kind of whole genome sequencing approach is really going to shed light in ways that we probably didn't realize was going to shed light on before. And so to, um, I've got the final few slides here, so just bear with me, um, to highlight a couple of other uh, consortia that are actually starting to hit at lots of genomes sequencing. Uh, there's one, one uh, uh, group called the Cancer Genome Atlas. It's nice that it's TCGA. A lot of people like to be nifty in that way, um, where they're trying to do a lot of tumor sequencing and make this, these data publicly available. Another group, uh, they call themselves the Thousand Genomes Consortium. They're trying to uh, accurately sequence over a thousand genomes to identify variants that are occurring at uh, lower and lower allele frequency within the human population. And this is going to be also a very useful resource in, in comparing to other new genomes. The other thing I'd like to uh, kind of throw out at you is, you know, maybe all of this technology that we're trying to learn in-house and buy all of these machines um, is going to be supplanted by the fact that it's going to become easier to just do this as a service. I just throw this out as a, as a hypothesis. I'm not necessarily advocating this. But this is actually a company I wanted to make you aware of. They call themselves Complete Genomics. And I think for on the order of $5,000 a genome, you, of course, need to do more than one genome at a time. You send them the sample, and they send you back the genome sequence. And you don't. And what they have is a proprietary technology in-house. They've built essentially an industrial-sized genome center um, to be able to accurately and rapidly sequence genomes and provide you with the variants. Because um, you might not be as excited about the technology or, or advancing the the methodologies of things, which is really where this state, where this field is at right now, is in a method development stage and trying to refine these tools. You might just be after where are the variants, and and you don't want to invest in a big, you know, half a million or million dollar sequencing machine and and do all of this. Maybe it's worth your while to just spend tens of thousands of dollars on sequencing a number of genomes, and you get that back as a service. They've actually re recently released. Um, uh, some data that was generated from their proprietary technology. I think it was three human genomes uh, that were available. And two of these human genomes, I believe, were sequenced by multiple other technologies now as well. And so you can download these data and check it out yourself. I actually like, I mean, I, I appreciate what they need to do, but their little legal disclaimer, which is kind of funny if they're trying to say this is how accurate their genome is, is I think it says what, the human genome and sequence data are preliminary and may contain errors. Well, of course we know that, but obviously they have to say that on their, their web page, but I found it kind of amusing in, a, in them trying to say this is all great and accurate and everything. But keep your eye out for this company called Complete Genomics. It's certainly <coughs> in the field of things along with Illumina and AB and, and Roche and Life Technologies now of all these companies really trying to, to um, make genome sequencing kind of a commodity tool. So uh, I'd like to just kind of end with these, these final couple of ideas here in that um, th we're starting to approach a time where it might be realistic to say that a, a genomic DNA sample and, and identifying the variants that are in you could help diagnose a disease, could help figure out, I think more importantly, figure out how you will respond to certain drugs and which drugs you might be responding to better. And this is, I think, one of the main reasons why we're after doing a lot of these whole genome sequencing efforts in trying to translate this to the clinic. Um, I think this is going to make this translation happen in kind of unprecedented ways. So this concept of kind of a designer prescription tailored for you, what, what your alleles are, uh, and how you're going to respond is going to, I think, tremendously benefit the, the medical and public health community. Uh, and so with that, I will end. The AV guy made me end with this slide rather than a blank slide, so I will leave that up and take any questions you might have. Thank you very much.